Look what you had gotten yourself into. Caught red-handed, talking to a skull in a box, and eating from a magical platter of food you had found in a strange house. Now, you had some explaining to do. Dressed in robes of ice blue, this woman stood over you, her black hair held loosely back by a band of silver. Her gaze pierced through whatever you thought you were. She made no effort to ease your anxiety. Her skin, though inhumanly pale, shimmered in the light of the room. She really did glitter. Candles wavered in her presence, their light not worthy to grace her features. When she drew close to the flames, they crackled and popped in misery, all bending in chorus when she spoke. Do not stand there gawping. Answer me. Rattled into reality, you tried your best to shake the fear from your voice as you explained you were guided here. How can such a thing be true? No creature could venture into this place, let alone inside this abode. The space around this structure and its doors are barred from any sentient creature entering. This must be a cruel trick indeed. Perhaps you are not sentient then, she quipped, a bemused smirk appearing from the corner of her mouth. You had to be careful of your next steps. You had a feeling with one move, she could dash you across the kitchen floor and find a good use for your remains. You went to ask her how it could be impossible when you had done it with such ease, but recalled what happened in the forest. You tossed every piece of information about the path, the forest and the mushroom who told you of this place, then you remembered the delivery you promised to make. Setting your pouch on the table, you cupped your hand and scooped up the small mushrooms inside. Presenting the fungi to her, you conveyed the mushroom made it clear to give their offspring to the one who resides in this dwelling. She repeated what you had said. A mushroom told you to come here and give me its children. She pondered for a moment, then recognition caught her expression. She tutted in resistance, infuriated at such a thing being spoken in her presence. Oh, it took the form of a mushroom this time. That being is called the many, an old thing, too mischievous for its own good. Then it's nearby and decided to seek your aid. You're lucky. That is all it wanted. Beware what sticks to your brain matter, for many can use it to counter you. After the revelation, the woman seemed to relax in your presence. No matter. You have made the final delivery. What a good little servant you are. This was needed to continue my task, but I did not realize it was the many who would be granting it. This woman moved with an unearthly grace as she swirled about the room with a wave of her flowing sleeves. She reached out to take the mushroom. Though her hands were delicate in size, her nails were long and sharp, thin blades with silver veins running through them. Such long nails should have grazed the skin of your outstretched hand, but you felt nothing. As soon as the fungi were in her grasp, a pearlescent smile crackled out. My title 
is Yukimi. And though you came unannounced, you have done a great service here tonight. When she bowed her head, her black hair flowed above her shoulder as though under water. A body not of matter, but of silk. You instinctively bowed yourself and gave her your name out of respect. With the awkward silence quickly brewing, you offered your assistance to the task at hand. Give me some time and space. Careful thinking and planning are needed. I do not think you have any experience with bonding matter before. Even in my experience is limited great flesh of another kind. These mushrooms, what will we create from you? You can be held them up to the light of the candles, observing every fault and wrinkle they preserved. You politely inquired what she planned to do with the mushrooms, if you were allowed to know such knowledge. These sounds you admit from your mouth, do they have any purpose? <laughs> I jest. Some transformation is required, yes, but the formula eludes me. Time will give me the answer, and space will show me the way. However, I could use what the many showed you to my advantage. She peeled herself back and ascended into something you knew. The languages behind time quivered as they pulsed beneath your brain. She was something that you were, and something you will meet again. With one movement she carried herself across the room and flooded your senses with eerie visions. A parade of particles paralleled one another before falling in and out of view. The images of freshly born celestial bodies sailed across your eyes, bleaching into mechanisms unknown. Though mesmerising, the feeling of it tugged at your heart like a balloon slowly being stretched to its limits, ready to break. It felt so far away, a dizzy sensation engulfed you, your hands gripped at the back of a chair for balance. Is this what the many showed you? Yukimi asked. No, you thought. It was an artificial, poor copy of what you had seen in the woods. But you didn't say that to Yukimi. You said it was somewhat similar. But the words to describe the mushroom's vision were transcendent while hers were muted to a vibrant degree. It was lacking at the foundation only a spectacle rather than a miracle. You said it was close to what you saw, yet something fundamental was missing, but you did not know what. It was more like a dream than anything else, and with that, you hoped you hadn't offended her. <sighs> Fair enough. Although I have been practicing for a very long time, Never mind. It will do. I have all the ingredients, while for many was only made of one source. Things will be different. Nothing is perfect. Her thoughts almost flashed behind her eyes. She was lost until a reptile-like blink brought her back into place. I'm not afraid of the sacrifices that must be made, but I will be sure to uproot my brain matter if I get this wrong. Oh, that's extreme. This all must be for something monumental. With an elegant wave of her hand, Yukimi clicked her tongue. You are discharged. I see you are no threat, only a messenger at a minimum, that you bring no message to guide me. How will I process this spawn of the many? No implements at my aid. I did not expect much, but this is abysmal. Never mind. 
Never mind. It is all for a loss, anyway. You may retreat to explore the rest of the abode. I have no qualms if you do. There are others, however. So please do knock when entering a room. I think they would like some company. Yukimi then catapulted herself into her work, flying across the room to grasp improvised instruments. In her flurry she bumped into you without any regard for manners or bruising. You took this as your cue to leave. Making your way towards the door again, the last thing you witnessed was Yukimi reducing her hands into the fiery embers of the hearth. Closing the kitchen doors behind you, the atmosphere shifted while you were gone. The decorations in the corridor had warped and stretched, angling themselves to direct you to the opposite end, beckoning you to go back on yourself, see what was on the other side. The welcoming warmth now thickened the back of your throat. Striding quickly, you followed the corridor not knowing where else to go. One door, the last door, was left ajar for you. Remembering Yukimi's warning, you knocked on the partly open door. With no answer, you cautiously treaded inside. The interior was sparse, containing a rocking chair in one corner, a small book placed by the window, and another fireplace. A step into another past. The atmosphere presented itself to be a Victorian nursery room, although it was void of any furnishings to suggest so. It was just the air, and the discomfort of being so far from home. While the hearth in the kitchen kept that room well heated, this room felt almost damp with cold. This time the fireplace, shaped into an aged tree, looked almost alive. Directly under the blackened tree, a small fire burned. The wood supported its structure as tightly as twine binds, its thick branches seemingly supported this corner of the roof too. That single source of light illuminated the gloomy interior, where three girls draped in a blanket sat huddled together by the fire. Their eyes were on you. Had they been there the whole time? Their skin wasn't. They were all different colours, and the one closest, staring fiercely back at you, was a bright scarlet. They were all wearing simple, thin linen dresses, obviously not enough to keep them warm. Their conversation hushed, only the rustle of the smoke in the treetop broke the stillness of the room. You apologised for the intrusion and asked if it was okay to come inside. When no response was given, you took a small step forward in their direction. When they didn't flinch or try to stop you, you unclasped the brooch to your cloak and sliding it off your shoulders, you offered it to the girls. The scarlet one looked at her friends, her little sisters. Little sisters? Where had that come from? You knew it to be true, instinctually even though you did not know how you knew. Sisters could never look so different. The little girl waited a beat before snatching the cloak from your hand. It was just as red as her. Without taking her eyes off you, she took a step backwards, and then another, until she was in touching distance of her sisters. Only then did she tear her eyes away from you, 
to drape the fabric across their shoulders. More awkward silence. All three stared at you, gathering their hands upon another's. Did the heart wheel descend you? Oh, they all spoke as one. A confused no was the reply you gave, but it was not the answer they wanted. A twinge of disappointment resonated within their eyes. We worry. We think of reasons why you are here and where you came from. You explained how, as strange as it sounds, a mushroom guided you here. The lady in the kitchen, Yugami, told you that the mushroom was a being called Thameni, and you had been sent to deliver their children to her. The girls crouched and whispered anxiously to one another. Something you said had disturbed them although you could not tell what exact part had caused such a reaction. They had the same alarmed expression, ready to escape the room at a moment's notice. You conveyed to them you would happily leave them alone since your duty has been fulfilled. It is not that. It is the role you play in all of this. This was not meant to happen. Something is wrong. Before you could ask what, they hissed. This is a hideaway. Did it not concern you when you came upon this dwelling? The snow that fell here was misaligned to the land surrounding it? Well, yes, you did notice, but everything else had been so strange it didn't stand out. A piece of this world uprooted entirely. What was so precious to be hidden away? Or perhaps, what on earth was worth hiding to that degree? You turned around. The window showed nothing of the exterior. It was just complete darkness. Darting across the room, pressing yourself against the glass, you tried to block out the light from the fire, hiding behind a curtain, curling your hands around your eyes and peering out. Could anything be seen outside? No. Nothing. Not even the light from the room shone down on the snow-covered ground. It was as though the world had been washed away. Time to start again. Then came the shattering of plates and the fire roared. You snapped around and the girl of Scarlet was only mere feet away from you. She contemplated you as she uttered these words. We are completely different. I never lie. I will tell you everything I know, but you must promise to take everything I say to your grave. Forgive me. It is not pleasant to witness, but it must be done. If you come along, you will understand soon. It's behind me now. The scarlet girl quickly darted back to her sisters and gave them both a tender kiss on their foreheads. The two girls held on to their sister, their fists clenched tight to the fabric of her dress, as they kissed her together on the left and right cheek. Then the girl of red took you by the hand and led you quietly out of the room. Hadly doodly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh god, this this chapter just it I don't know. It just took so long to write and then all of a sudden it it all just came sprawling out of me right at the end, right up to the deadline, you know. I know I shouldn't be hard on myself about these deadlines, but there's they are specific like they have meaning to the story in, in a weird way or the, I don't know, I don't know. Anywho, I have a question to ask. 
I don't know. I'm in two minds about this. Do you think I should perhaps inquire about getting other people to do um, the voices of characters, you know, perhaps higher voice actors. I mean, I've d I don't have any money, but I'm, I'm sh I, yeah. Because <laughs> I was thinking, do I want this to be like an audio book where I narrate everything and I do all the character voices, even though, you know, my range is limited. I won't be able to do like a male voice per se, unless I, you know, altered it to make it deeper or, you know, or should I hire other people to do specific voices? I mean, I'm only, I'm, I'm just thinking about this because when I want to include male characters, you know, should I, should I get someone else involved? I, I really don't know. I mean, it's been easy so far because, you know, the characters so far have been women or genderless so I don't know yeah if you could let me know in the comments that would be a real great help because it's not going to be the next chapter but it's going to be a couple of chapters down and I just want to get everything sorted before you know stage 3-1 comes about <laughs> um but yeah thank you very much for listening and I hope you have a lovely day, evening, night, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. You know, I, it's, it's just so much fun hearing you guys get so excited about it. And I just keep rereading comments and it's just, it's so nice. I'm just so happy. Okay, but this is Silly signing out. Um, yeah, take care. Bye-bye.